morning, Michael. Good morning. Good Just making. Well, good morning. Uh, it's cold. You guys okay? I can't even pick up a pin. Look at that, snapped. Uh, well, good morning. I'm excited to be here uh, with those of you who are here or those of you who will be watching online. Uh, so again, last week uh, we kicked off this year really talking about vision. And uh, for us, our heart as a church family is really to help people become fully alive followers of Jesus. And so as we're transitioning um, into this next series, it is really still our heart. We're, this next several weeks are going to be really a practical conversation with hopefully um, lots of tools at your disposal to be able to grow in your love for God, your love for people, and helping others do the same. Uh, last week we talked uh, a lot about uh, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Other uh, phrasings of that is, uh, if the people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. Uh, if there's no revelation, people cast off their restraints. We run aimlessly um, with whatever our heart's leading us. And um, typically, I don't know about you, my heart is not always good at uh, pointing towards true north. My heart wanders. Um, my heart is selfish. And so whatever I want to do, I kind of want to do it. And I will justify whatever I need to justify to prove why this is right. Um, I could probably even use scripture to prove to you why it was okay that I'm doing this thing. And so again, we started the year, and this is I don't want last week's conversation to be just a one-off. Yep, got it, vision. This is kind of going to be the heartbeat that we want to keep reminding ourselves and each other. We need to have clear vision of who God is. That's where it starts. Um, how many of us started reading the Bible in a year? Because that's what you do on January. How many are still going? Okay, well... If you started, and I'm guessing starting with the Old Testament, the first page says, in the beginning, God. So our journey, our understanding needs to start there. In the beginning, God. So our pursuit, if we don't want to cast off restraints and run wild and end up in, in not good places, we need to start with who God is. And that's the starting point. And so we talked about at our tables, what does that look like? Some of the examples is God's word is a great place to start. God has revealed himself through the scripture, through the Bible. And what I love about this uh, age and time that we live in is it's readily available. All of us have access to Bibles. Um, some of us may still have them in our homes, but I think most of us have cell phones, and so we all have access to the Bible. What's even cooler today is, I understand, reading is challenging for some of us. Reading the Bible is even more challenging uh, than just normal reading. But what's great, our app, the Bible app, you press a button, it reads it to you. It's awesome. And so there's a great way to discover who God is through his word, also spending time with him. We talked about discovering who God is, and we talked about the me and the we. Do we know who me is? according to God. Do I know who I am? Do I know who he says I am? Do I know who I am when I'm with him, following him? Do I know who I am when I'm outside of his plan, his heart, his desire? And how do we wrestle that out? Again, God's word is a great place to start because he tells us in his word who we are, who you are. You are a son, a daughter, chosen, loved, cared for, he shares with you his heart, his plans, his purposes. And then he talks about who we are as a church. We're not just individuals who are individually following God in proximity to each other. He calls us a body. 
And for any of you who have a body or know who, how a body works, uh, it's not just individual things connected together. Like, they are connected. It works in harmony. One part fails. It usually isn't well for the rest of your body. And so some of it we have to understand who has God said that he is, who has he said that I am or me is, and who has he said we are together. And again, it's not a light switch. I wish it was. Some of this is going to be the pursuit, the journey of following God and following Jesus is as we follow him, we're going to discover more about who he is. We're going to discover the depth of of his love and character and heart for us and for the world around us. As we spend more time with him, we will discover who we are as we are being renewed by him and his spirit and his word. We get a clear understanding of where our value comes from. It doesn't come from what the world says you are or aren't. It comes from who he says you are and what you're not. And then us together, we're not just sitting in this brewery because it was a great idea to go, we should all like just randomly gather together. No, we gather like this because he's modeled and told us you are the body of Christ. Do not forsake the gathering of the saints. So gather together, look, learn and look what it looks like to be my people together. And so we've been wrestling that out. And as we're wrestling this out and discovering and growing, it's going to be ongoing, and part of the reading of God's Word, and if you are starting the Bible journey plan uh, this year, you find out really early in the first couple of pages some of God's mission. His mission when he created us was to partner with us in caring and stewarding creation. He breathed life into Adam and to Eve, and he partnered with them, said, go, work the land. This was before sin came in, and so all of us who wrestle about working, that's part of God's design. And so we see that God, his heart is to uh, bless creation, and he does that through his people. He set up Adam and Eve to be a blessing to creation. Obviously, sin came in, broke that all down. And then we see throughout the Old Testament, God renewing his covenant to people. He made a covenant with Noah to save them from the flood. And it goes on. We know about the one uh, to Abraham. In Genesis 12, he tells Abraham, I will bless you and make a great nation from you. And uh, you will... Uh, make you famous, and you'll be a blessing to others. So I will bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. We ultimately know that the fulfillment of that blessing to all families and all of that was through Jesus, but that's still God's desire. When Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, he's telling us, take this good news that, that you've been blessed with, this relationship that has been restored between you and the Father. Take this and go and share this. Be a blessing to the world around you. It's a call to, to be a blessing, to invite others back home to be with God. And so as we're wrestling through what does it look like for, for us, who God is, his mission is to be, uh, to bless creation. What is our part in that? And it is to be a blessing. We see um, as uh, Paul was writing to the church, uh, the, uh, the Colossian church, he's reminding them that everything they do and say is to be part of that blessing of sharing the good news, inviting those to come back home, to follow God, his original design. He says in Colossians 4, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders or those who do not yet believe. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone about who you are 
and your identity comes from Christ. So I am set free. I am full of joy, peace, hope because of God and what he has done. Peter uh, writes in 1 Peter 3, he tells the scattered church, he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously of you against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Again, he's, Peter's reminding us, you don't have to fight the battles. Just be who you are in Christ and share with those who are curious. Share, but don't be condescending, uh, condemning. Some of this call to, from Jesus right before he left to go and make disciples, a lot of us hear that. And if you grew up in or around the church, you probably have flashbacks of what it means for you to go and evangelize. Some of you are probably like, yeah, those are the glory days. Some of you are like, no, I hated that. I will tell you, I hated that. So you want me to go knock on doors and hand random strangers these random pieces of paper? Or like, you know, the, hey, I want to bless you. And you it looks like you're handing somebody money and it's like, ha, got you. It's a track that tells you how you are going to hell unless you, or, and again, if, if you're one of those, I'm not trying to offend um, if you're one of those who has a megaphone and a soapbox, I love you. Let's talk after. But those who stand on the corner, God loves you so much. That's usually not what they're saying. Love is rarely in those conversations. But that's what we were told. This is what it looks like to go and evangelize. But when we look at scripture, we don't see that. We see God wanting to be a blessing to people and, and wants to partner with, with those who believe in him or are following him to be a blessing to those in their lives, which is a radical switch. Uh, I don't know if some of you have heard or were told, if you don't share your faith with those people, whoever those people are, if you don't share your faith, they are going to hell. And some were even told, and it's your fault because you're not sharing your faith with them. People are going to end up in hell because of you. I want to lovingly say whoever told you that was misinformed. For one, you and I have, don't have the power to save or condemn anyone. That's God's job. He is very good at it. It's above our pay grade. I once had a friend whose wife was told because they didn't go on a mission trip when she was 16, people were going to burn in hell because of that. And I went, man, that sounds like my God is very small if that is true. My God is way bigger than that. That's the God that I read in Scripture who can do miraculous things who can make a donkey, I won't do the King James version of that, a donkey can speak. You don't think he can handle a 16-year-old getting afraid to not go on a mission trip when, you know, you think he's like, oh, yeah, bummer for those people. Sorry. No, God is bigger than that. But also, we do have a part to play. And so that's that weird tension of God is partnering with us. The results don't depend on us, but he invites us into it because he loves us and he wants us to be a blessing just as he's blessed us. And so we want to wrestle out as, a, as individuals, but also as a church family, what does it look like for us to join Jesus in his mission to reconcile the world? What does that look like for you Personally, what does that look like for us together? And some of that, we have to wrestle out what is God's heart, what's our part, and what is it that we do together? 
because I think sometimes we think evangelism, and there is the gift of evangelist, evangelism. There are some people who, who, who are gifted at talking about God and inviting others to join. It's a gift. Not all of us have it, and that is okay. But that doesn't excuse those who don't have it or don't believe that we have it from sharing our life with those around us. Because when Jesus said, go and make disciples, he didn't say, just you who are pastors, just you who are comfortable, just you who are gifted. He told us all, go and make disciples. It's translated as, as you go. So as you are living your normal, every day, sometimes fun, sometimes boring life, as you go, are you making disciples? Are you sharing what you have been given with those around you? And so one practical tool that we're going to jump into and spend several weeks on, and I'm just going to kind of highlight the tool. And so this is a tool. It is a resource. It's not the resource, but it's a tool to help us practice uh, being a blessing. And so this is the bless rhythm. Has anybody ever heard of the bless rhythm before? Cool. So it's an acronym. Each letter represents something else. Um, and so it stands for this. B is a little bit of a cheat, so just bear with me. Uh, B is begin with prayer. L is listen. E is eat. S is serve. And the second S is story. And so I'll briefly unpack each of these um, by sharing that this is what this group that put this together, and this has been a, a resource for years, this is somebody trying to put together a basic understanding based on what they saw Jesus do. As Jesus is uh, our perfect example of what it looks like to live for God, He's the one that modeled it for us. He's the one that told us to follow him. We see in scripture, Paul tells us to imitate him as he's imitating Jesus. And so Jesus is the one we look to. He's the one that calls us to follow him. And so we look to him for examples. And we see throughout the gospels, Jesus began with prayer. He began with prayer. Often the disciples would wake up and go, where's Jesus? And they would have to search for him. And what was he doing? He was praying. His parents lost him on a field trip to the temple. And his first response was, well, where did you think I would be? I'm going to be in my father's house praying. And so Jesus modeled everything he did started with prayer. And we see that throughout his language. He said, I don't do anything out of my own initiative. I only do what I have been told to do by the father. Well, where did he get that? In prayer. And then we see, listen. Jesus spent a lot of time listening to people. He would often ask questions, and sometimes it's frustrating when someone asks you a question, and then, or you ask somebody a question, and they ask you another question instead of answering you. Jesus was great at that. Why? Because he wanted to listen to people. He would see someone who was lame or handicapped, and he would ask them, What do you want from me? It's pretty clear, Jesus. I'm hurting, I'm broken but he wanted to listen to them. He wanted them to vocalize. I would love to see. I would love to walk. He listened to them. Sometimes we don't listen to those around us. We just want to fix them by what we think they need. But Jesus was always a great listener. He listened to, to the people around him. Eat pretty self-explanatory. Nope. Okay. I got some no's in the back. So you need to eat to survive. That is uh, one thing all of us as humans share. We need sustenance. Jesus modeled that. He ate with people and he often got criticized for who he ate with. 
That was one of the biggest slights. He eats with nefarious people. He eats with sinners. But he knew he needed to eat, and that's a great place to connect and to build relationship. The next S is serve. Jesus was always looking to serve people. He said, if you want to be great, you need to be the greatest servant, the servant of all. Jesus modeled that with his life. He was looking for opportunities to serve people. And then story. He loved hearing people's story and connecting their story to God's story. Or he'd re-correct their understanding of God's story. You've heard it said this, but I tell you the truth. This is what it means. He was coming to share and connect God's story. In this, this acronym BLESS is a great and simple handles for us to learn what it looks like for us in our everyday lives. If you're gifted as an evangelist, you're like, come on, I already got this. But for the rest of us, how do we love those around us? I've been a pastor for, I don't know, since 99, however many years that is. Most of it has been, oh man, how, how open do I want to be? Most of it has been trying to do the right church thing and helping get other people to do the right church thing. Missing out on my neighbors, missing out on my family during certain seasons. And having people look at me thinking, well, you've got it figured out because you're a pastor. And, um, and some of the weird pressures that get put on were put on me and those of my friends who are pastors. And to be perfectly honest with you, we are figuring it out. I am figuring it out just as much as you are. Every year I get older, the more I don't have stuff figured out, the more what I thought I was certain in, I'm less certain in. But each of those opportunities of, for me that are hard to face, like even sharing with you, like, I don't know how to pray really well. And I could go, well, that's, I'm not gifted in prayer. Some of you are. I can just use that a cop out. Or I don't talk to people about my faith. Well, I'm not gifted as an evangelist, so I guess that's fine. I can share all those things. And, and the heartache, because we all want to be loved. We all want to be appreciated. And so sometimes we put on masks based on what I think people want to see. And we put on masks because we want people to like us. And some of it is hard as I'm growing and we're growing to follow Jesus means we have to take off those masks. And it's scary because some of us have been wearing certain masks for decades. And it's really scary because sometimes we believe the lie that we've been living with. But Jesus has come to set us free. He paid the price on the cross so that we don't have to live in shame or guilt or condemnation. And some of it, the hardest part, is me taking those masks off. And so when I come across an, uh, a really practical tool, I'm not sharing going, listen, come along. Let's, hopefully you'll get to where I'm at. I'm going, these are really helpful for me. And so we want to share them with you. And so, because I, if I were to ask people who love Jesus in this room, many hands would go up. And that's awesome. I go, how many of you are faithful to Jesus and sharing your life with others? So hands would start to, well, they'd probably stay up because we like to say that we are. And I'm not here to point fingers and go, well, I am a little bit, but not, I'm not going to single people out because I'm in the same boat. And in our effort to want to help us to become fully alive followers of Jesus, I can't just get up here or whoever can't just get up here and go, 
If you love God, do better. Work harder. Stop being dumb. It's in the Bible. Just do what it says. We would never say it like that. We would make it way more eloquent. And some of you are probably flashbacking to even some of the things I've said. And I, again, I've apologized many times as I'm learning too and I need grace. And so this is a tool and a resource to help you take steps. Again, we talked about it last week. The God, me, and we thing. We're going to need God's help to increase our faith to believe some of those things. Sometimes, again, I need faith to believe that God is the provider. That's his name, Jehovah Jireh. It's in the Bible. I can intellectually know it, but do I live my life based on that? Or am I working really hard, two, three, four jobs, trying to make ends meet because Ultimately, yes, God is a provider, but if I don't do stuff, then I have to rely on him. No, I don't want to rely on him. When God says, you are loved, sometimes that's hard for me to believe, and I need God's faith to increase my faith to step into, I am loved. Those things I've done in my past don't define me. Jesus' blood covers those. Same with we. I've been hurt in the church. I have hurt people in the church. And so there's the part of me that wants to run from the church. But God says it's his bride that he loves. He has some colorful metaphors for describing her. But if the youth weren't in the back of the room, I would share, but they're in the Bible. We are messed up, but we are loved by God, and he's coming back for us. And so there's a part of us that need to wrestle out what does it look like to live in community. And we need God to increase our faith. Um, so this is a a resource but it's only a resource if we're at a place of being willing to trust God because I can preach and I can go back to my script and actually preach I kind of am not going off and just preach and tell you what you need to do but again, I've done that for years. And I've gotten lots of attaboys. Great sermon. But my heart, I don't care about that stuff anymore. I want us to be fully alive. I want you to be fully alive. Some of that is going to take us confessing sin to one another. Sharing, this is where I fall short. Some of it is going to be willing to wrestle out where we are actually at in our faith with Jesus. It's hard to go, I've been a pastor for 20-something years, but I've probably only been faithfully following Jesus half of that. not talking salvation. I'm talking following Jesus. Not just going, God, bless the life that I want to live. Just come along, Jesus. I'll hold you in my little backpack, and when I need you, I'll pull you out and say the magic words. But actually going, my life is yours. What would you have me do today? Those are radically different. And some of it is, my heart is that we were all in that place, but I know the reality is we're not, because I am not. And I could keep preaching at you, pointing to you where the water's at, and I've shared this with many, 
I'm thirsty. Cool, there's a water. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink it, right? I've led horses to water. I've kneecapped horses, so their faces are in the water. If you don't want to drink, you ain't going to drink. I can't force you. But I can present resources and tools that if you are hungry, what I love about God, this is also found in his word, the Bible, if you seek him, you will find him. If you have a desire to grow, he will bless that. He is faithful to meet you where you're at. If you've been in church for years and you keep hearing the, the thing, you should be further along than this. If you told them that you don't know how to pray or that you don't actually love your neighbors, they won't love you. They'll actually kick you out. That's not the voice of God. I've spent many years, and it wasn't until probably seven or eight years ago, I was at a conference where we had to grade our love for God one out of ten. I said eight. Me and God are tight. I'm not perfect. Eight, though. That's great. Then they said, now, rate your love for people. One to ten. People suck. This is well into... 15 plus years of being a pastor, people suck. Two. Person went, that's probably more reflective of your love for God. You probably love God too. And that really shook me because God doesn't distinguish the difference. And so for us, I'm not trying to just be confrontational or point fingers. I'm trying to shake us and wake us up do we have a clear vision of who God is? Do we have a clear vision of who me is? And do we have a clear vision of who we is? I know that's not grammatically correct, but the teachers aren't here this week, I don't think, so we're good. And so this is a tool that will help us if we're willing to try to join God at being a partner, to be a blessing to those around us. God is going to call many of us into uncomfortable places. And I don't want to be the one that's prescribing because sometimes we skip the place of actually beginning with prayer. Well, there's people broken and hurting over there. Cool, did you pray? Is that where God has you to go? Because if, if he hasn't, it's going to be tough. He's still good and faithful but he probably has you planted in a place, a home, a workplace, a school, and that's where he wants you to be a blessing. One last thing before I kick at the table, there was a, a, a group that was sent on a mission trip. There was two groups. One who said, we are evangelists and we're gonna go and preach the gospel. And uh, they labeled that group the converters. And uh, then there was another group sent to the same region. And they said, we just want to figure out how to be a blessing. Because God has blessed us and called us to be a blessing. So those will be the blessers. They spent two years loving this community. After two years, they did lots of study. They went two years after those who were there to preach the gospel and convert people. What were the benefits? Did they make the spaces that they were in better? Better said, if those people were to leave the community, would the community even know? So that was one qualifier. The converters, minimal impact in the community, in the lives of the people around them. After two years, they led two people to Christ. Awesome. Probably worth it. Two people now know that God loves them and has a plan and a purpose for them. The group of people who went to the same community with a heart just to be a blessing, to make the city around them better. It was astronomical how much 
better that community was because these people were living for the benefit of the city. That if those people were removed from the community, the community would mourn their loss. At the same time, they also led a hundred people to the Lord. That's wild. They were looking at being a blessing. What they've received from God, they wanted to share it with those around them. And so they looked for areas that were hurting, and they prayed for those and engaged. They looked for places that were broken. They went in and fixed what they could and engaged. And so if you have the gift of evangelism, praise God. Use your gift faithfully. If you don't, I would even say the evangelist. Be, learn how to be a blessing where you live, work, and play. And so this um, conversation we're going to have at the tables is a very brief dive into this. Uh, I want to share with you, if you have the app, um, I would pull it out during your table time. There's this really neat pocket guide. If you're a giant, it's this big. Um, but it's a little PDF on your phone that walks you through what does it look like to begin with prayer? What does it look like to have a rhythm of praying? And what's beautiful is that God's already at work around us. He's not asking you to invent or create anything. He's really just asking you to join him and partner with him where he's already at work. So there's a great resource there. And then there's tons of resources. I think I put six or seven on there. Places of, I don't know where to start with prayer. There's lots of prayer guides that, that walk you through very basics of spending time with God, beginning in prayer. Um, so as we dive in, go through the discussion. Please make sure you can access those resources. And then I'd love for you to take uh, a moment at the end of our time. There should be these papers um, on your tables. There are three little circles that say context. I'd love for you to, as you're discussing this and praying through, where are the, the, time, the places, the context that you spend most of your life, most of your time? I'm guessing some of, for most of it's going to be home, work, and maybe a third place. Write those there, and then just spend a moment before we will close. Spend a moment just praying. God, would you reveal people in those contexts? For family, it should be fairly easy. It's those in your family, but in your workplace, there might God might be bringing names to mind. And and then pray, pray for them. And the guide. This one has lots of great prayers that you can pray for them. So, we okay? I think we're okay to go to groups? Yes. All right. Let me pray. God, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for us. God, I thank you that you don't want us just to be saved. You want us to be alive. You have invited us to follow you. It's not always easy, but it is amazing because you were there. And so God, I pray that you would bless this time that we are together. I pray that you would encourage us, give us faith to, to be honest and vulnerable, to take risks during our conversation. And God, we pray that you would continue to grow us into the sons and daughters that you've created us to be. God, I thank you for this time. Pray that you would uh, be glorified in our conversation. In Jesus' name, amen.